So uh, you can post at the end. So we're just about to start. Um, you're very welcome, everybody, yet again, to Traz and Atira, who uh, are here to tell our history um, during this 2020 lockdown. Now, tonight, uh, we're going to be looking at the 1798 Rebellion. Uh, so thanks to Lima Sullivan, uh, Neve uh, Hassett, Ben, Aideen Hassett, and all of you who have uh, joined for this event. Um, so as I always say, we're not going to let some virus prevent us from remembering our great Irish history during this 2020 lockdown. Uh, instead, we're going to use this platform to share and to preserve our history. Uh, this week, we also have talks on, on Tuesday. We have Ireland's Disused Schoolhouses by Enda O'Flaherty. On Wednesday, we have the Cistercians in Medieval Ireland by Dr. Breda Lynch. On Thursday, we have Belfast and the War of Independence by Andrew Clark. And on Friday, we have Irish Republican Memorials by Shea Olansig. Our speaker tonight, Colm O'Rourke, studied archaeology in Sligo and carried out his undergrad in a licensed metal detection of the battlefield of Vinegar Hill in 2009, which is really interesting. And that was to determine the specific hotspots of the battle. The interest for 1798 for him would stem back to his childhood and the bicentennial uh, parades. And it's his aim to accumulate as many casualty names for those who died as a result of the rebellion. Now, Colm also runs a very popular Facebook history page, the 1798 Rebellion Casualty Database. And he's also featured in two documentaries that I've made on the 1798 Rebellion, and they're called 1798 Year of Blood. And uh, they feature on the Easter Rising Stories YouTube channel. Uh, Paddy Cullivan and a number of historians and reenacting groups are also in it. Uh, Colin and myself have travelled around all the hills, hedges and fields around Ireland to do with uh, 1798. And what I find interesting about Irish history is many people today look up to the people in 1916 to 22. But if you look at who they looked up to, often in the witness statements, it was often those from the 1798 period. About this talk, uh, a lot of people know or have heard about some of the leaders of 1798. For example, the Wolf Tones, the Lord Edward Fitzgeralds, the Napper Tandies, but not many people know who the people who actually fought were. And Colm does. Maybe you know of a relative who fought in 1798, but you're not sure on which side did the fight. You might get a surprise from this talk. If you have any questions, just post below and we can read them at the end. So sit back, relax, forget about the news for the next hour and learn about the 1798 rebellion and who actually took part in it. Colm, you're very welcome. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks for the Great words there. I'd like to um, thank Trustin is here for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. And I hope everyone keeps safe during this uh, period. It's very strange times that we're um, experiencing. Now I'm going to um, I'm going to put you onto the PowerPoint here now. So I'll, I'll talk alongside us, so it'll be a bit more uh, helpful when I'm talking. So we'll have a look here now. Right, so today's topic is the 1798 Rebellion Casualty Database, an update. So we're going to focus on, we're going to look at the, the birth of the idea, which was in July 2017, and why this project came about. Uh, we're going to look at the benefits of this project to Irish history, and um, we're going to look at the earliest research, what, I, uh, what paths it took to, um, to carry out this project. I look at, uh, I'll give examples of archival sources, newspapers, and eyewitness accounts that I had a look at. I'm going to discuss folklore, headstones, and um, I'm going to discuss the project at present, and then also the, the future of the project. So there's a nice image there of Vinegar Hill. If anyone that has, doesn't know, this, is the, this was the famous battle site in County Wexford, where the battle was fought on June 21st, 1798. We believe that about 1,000 people were killed up in this uh, hill on that on that very bloody day. But here's the windmill, as you can see, and this unfortunately was um, the prison for the loyalists that were kept as prisoners on Vinegar Hill during the rebel occupation, which was about three weeks long. Unfortunately, 1798 isn't all that people think of it was. It was actually quite 
bloody in, in many time in many cases it was sectarian and unfortunately there was a lot of innocent blood was spilled outside the door of that Whitfire windmill there. Um right, so Marcus just touched off how a lot of people know about Wolf Tone, Robert Emmett, Henry Joy McCrack and the Shears brothers, Thomas Russell, Lord Edward Fitzgerald and Oliver Bond. Now these are the, the most famous faces of seventeen ninety eight and they all died as a result of the rebellion whether by their own hand or from wounds received or from execution. Um, the, we all know these be casualties, so I was more intrigued by the low-ranking people, the people who, who the pikemen, the pike women, the root hackets, uh, all these people that just died and were forgotten about outside of the local areas. And, and sadly, in, in today's case, a lot of them are actually forgotten in their local areas. So here we have an example of second tier United Irish leaders. Some people might know, and in some cases we actually have British uh, casualties here as well. We have Father John Murphy of Bula Vogue, who was executed in Tolo in a gruesome fashion. We have Father Michael Murphy of Ballycanoe, who was killed at the Battle of Arklow. We have Luke Gardner, who Gardner Street in Dublin is called after, also known as Lord Now Joy. He was quite—he was actually a Liberal MP. Uh, he died whilst uh, commanding the Dublin Militia at the Battle of New Ross. We have Viscount O'Neill, who died of his wounds that he received at the Battle of Antrim on, on June 7th. Uh, we have Colonel Jonas Watson, who rode out to the insurgents after the Battle of Three Rocks and was shot dead. We have uh, the Donegal Presbyterian Minister, Reverend James Porter, where he was based in Grey Abbey in County Down. Uh, he was executed for his involvement in the United Irishman. We have Esmond Kine, uh, the West, North Wexford Artillery Officer who was executed after the failure of the Wexford Rebellion. Edward Roach, another uh, Wexford leader. Bagnell Harvey, one of the principal United Irish leaders in Wexford. We have uh, Colonel Lambert Walpole who was, um, who was killed at the Battle of Tubineering. We have Richard St. George Manstrow who was executed, sorry, who was assassinated in an arms raid at the home of Jasper Uniac in early 1798. And then we have the linen, the linen uh, tradesman Henry Munro of Lisbon, who unfortunately was forced to become the, the leader of the County Down, the United Irish Forces, uh, fled after the Battle of Ballina Hinch and was unfortunately executed. So the birth of the project was actually in July 2017, and the, my influences came from the 1916 Centennial Project. There was so much going on at the time, as we remember, there was lots of stuff on television, and there was a lot of books being released, fantastic work being done across. And I noticed there was a lot of history pages being set up across Facebook, and it, it touched off um, 1916 to 1923, touched off... Uh, um, World War One and things like that. And what I loved about it was the the detail they gave to these lower ranking individuals, the people who played their part in in that period. Uh, we all knew about Patrick Pierce and Thomas Clark and Sean McDermott. We didn't know much about the men who printed the proclamation, the men who, and women who who served at, uh, who served their time in St Stephen's Green or Jacobs uh, Mills or South Dublin Union, things like that. I was fascinated by the roles of honour that were um, coming out for uh, the 1916-23 period and looking at all these names of people that we were meant to class as heroes, but we've never come across these names before outside of their local areas. It, it, was, uh, it was very fascinating to me. So I actually asked the question, whilst reading the book here on the right-hand side, the Miles, Miles Bourne Memoirs, um, there was never a large scale role of honour ever done for 1798 casualties. Like, it's estimated 30,000 people died during that summer. But even a small list, there was nothing ever done for 1798. And considering it was very influential for the United Ireland, uh, for the Young Irelanders, the Fenians, and uh, Irish Republicanism of the 20th century. Also, 1798 history is becoming very. Uh, it's getting targeted, it's getting somewhat edited out of Irish history presently, including, as I've noticed in, in school books, it's um, it's not relevant anymore to, to some, unfortunately. 
So uh, benefits to Irish history. So genealogical benefits being one, the majority of uh, parish registers across Ireland didn't begin until the 1820s onwards. So a lot of people have been asking me on the page, um, would I have much information that helped them bring their family trees back into the 1700s? In some cases, yes. Uh, the National Archives has great information with lists of thousands of pikemen and women who surrendered in the summer of 1798, and including addresses. So the page that I run, the 1798 Rebellion um, Casualty Database, I published stories from 1791, from the foundation of the United Irishmen right up to 1805, which, which saw the, the end of the insurgency in County Wicklow and any of the outlaw bands, these banditis that were called, that were uh, based in woodlands and the hills across Ireland. Um, everything in between, I will focus on. I'll even, I'll even focus on the Emmet Rebellion of 1803. Uh, what I do love is the public engagement. I love how people come and give their their, their views or their, their own version of it, or even their local history, which adds to it. It's, it's fantastic. Um, naturally, respecting the remembrance of the dead is, is crucial. But um, my aim of the page is to further promote the 79th Rebellion to the to the public. So my earliest research, I showed a picture of the book earlier, uh, Miles Byrne's Notes of an Irish Exile, Volume 1. It, he was, I will, I'll touch off Miles Byrne now briefly, but a uh, fantastic book. Um, Miles Byrne was a hero of John Mitchell, of the Young Irelanders, and he, he, even though he left Ireland in 1803 and he died in the early 1860s, he never lost his North Wexford accent and he never had to set foot back in Ireland. Um, but he always kept his ear and one eye in Ireland. He always kept an eye in Ireland. He was he uh, he was the godfather of a sense of the Young Ireland movement. And um, but uh, we'll have a look at him now briefly. Uh, I, I established the Facebook page in July in two thousand seventeen, and um, I had an arsenal of books that I've been collecting over the years with seventy nine year rebellion and. After reading Miles Byrne's memoirs, I had a look through all these various books and I found casualties here and there, and I was helped by a lot of people, and such as uh, Dr. Rowan O'Donnell, uh, CJ Woods, who, who were fantastic work with advice and where to go, and, and um, they gave me more sources to collect, which I've been doing for over the last couple of years. And I've just been finding names everywhere. It's, it's fantastic. It's great. And up to now, I have close to 4,000 casualty names from from across Ireland and even including Britain, uh, from the rebel insurgents, the, uh, the Crown forces and the loyalists. Uh, so this, I established the database, the database list. I don't really share much of that because I haven't completed it and I'm not one for sharing much information when I know it's not fully completed. I, I, I'm just like that. Um, so here we are, Miles Gorn with Monash Seed. As you can see, he was 18 years of age at the time of the rebellion. He's, uh, he's actually the only known photographed pikeman. And here's the image of him here that was colorized by Michael Fortune not too long ago. Uh, it's a fantastic image taken in Paris. And he was well in his 70s at that stage. But if you look at those hands and you look at those eyes, they were eyes that, that looked at the battle at the battles across North Wexford. Those hands held the pike that face he faced the British lines. His memoirs are fantastic. It's it's he's not really an eloquent writer, but uh, very to the point. It's 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 you know he's a he's a tactician, you know he, he's writing with a military point of view from his experiences later in the Napoleonic Wars. Here's a a sketch that was done by his wife in eighteen forty and he was actually a recipient of the Legion of Honor. He joined the Irish Legion and served under Napoleon in the Peninsula War. And um, he became a colonel in the French army and retired, I believe, in, in the 1840s. He wrote his memoirs right after. He died in 1862, uh, just before his memoirs were published. So he was very influential to me and to this project because he had a fantastic, because of his fantastic stories, and after 60 years of being away from Ireland, he was able to remember neighbours, friends, relations, people who died 
uh, while serving alongside him. So here's a list, just a, a small list that came across of names the pe of people who died uh, in the 1790 rebellion that are mentioned in Miles Bourne's memoirs. So you can see the close proximity, a lot of them are from the same area. And it just makes you wonder, like, it, it, bring, it brought me back to the estimation of 30,000 people being killed in the rebellion. When you see a small parish like that, look at those names, and I'm sure he didn't record all the names. When you see such a small area of North Wexford, and a lot of them died in the Battle of Arklow, in at Vinegar Hill, and small skirmishes all across Wexford and South Wicklow throughout the summer of 1798. It's quite sad, really. Like it's a very, very good memoirs, and I recommend that you would pick it up. So Here's the arsenal of weapon of, of sorry the arsenal of literature that I, I needed to get this project really going. Like I I've, I've collected so much over the years, but I've been uh, people have donated kindly donated books to me, and it's been fantastic the response I've got and people giving me extra sources to look up myself, and it's it's been a great journey. Um, possibly the most detailed book here would be the Mo uh, Sir Richard Musgrave's Members of the Irish Rebellion of 1798. A big, thick book, but it's absolutely jam-packed names. It's mostly the loyalist uh, community of Wexford, but it's still fantastic. It's, it's, um, it was very well done. He was um, a man of his time to record all these all his names just so immediately after the rebellion. But I've come to the point later, why wasn't the same done with the insurgent side? Like if if we were able to get hundreds of names of the Lylas community of Wexford, why couldn't we do the same for the insurgency, considering there was massacres on that side also? I'll touch on that point now shortly. So, um, 1798 memorials were important because at that stage, having started the project, I didn't really know many of these low-ranking uh, insurgents who had died. Here we have in Dungarvan, a memorial to Edmund Power, who was studying to become a Catholic priest in Maynooth. He was hanged and in Dungarvan for his membership in the United Irishman. Here in the bottom left, we have the memorial to Marty Daly, Edward Feeney and Michael Conway, who were executed just on the Offaly and Westmeath border. And because of their executions, um, it stemmed a lot of hostility in that, in that area. In the centre, we have the memorial to Father Prendergast, who was hanged at Monastery Evan on, in Kildare for having uh, carried out clerical duties whilst uh, at the rebel camp of Barn Hill. And um, at the bottom, we have a memorial for Hugh Kildee and Michael Murphy, who were hanged in Ennis Diamond in County Clare for their involvement in trying to assemble a... a, a, a an insurgent group in um, in his time in January 1799, bailed of course. Top right we have the memorial in Port Arlington. Uh, to several night Irishmen that were killed, and sorry executed. And at the very bottom, uh, near Clonigal in County Carlow, we have a memorial to Miley Dyle of Knockhorrigan, who was killed at the Battle of Arklon. There was a story that his remains were being brought home to Clonigal. The local, magistrate, the local magistrate, De Renzi, he refused uh, to allow Doyle's remains to be interred in the local graveyard. So his comrades brought him up into the fields and buried him upon his own land. And today, the memorial stands close to where his uh, remains lie. More examples of memorials we have in Bray and County Wicklow. We have the, the small memorial to Thomas Ledwidge, Richard Kennedy, and Patrick Nugent, who were United Irishmen who were executed in Little Bray in, in I think it was March or April 1798. The bottom left, we have a basic memorial to Roger Farrell, who was from Clondra in County Longford. Roger was escaping from the Battle of um, Ballinamook, making his way across the bogs, and unfortunately, he was killed. In the centre here, we have a memorial that's, that can be found at the Church of Ireland graveyard in Castle Cormor, County Kilkenny. And you'll find it's quite detailed. It's, it's dedicated to Martin Cairns of Kiltili, County Wexford, who was killed at the Battle of Castle Cormor. And it, it's, it's a bit of a family pedigree here. It's quite interesting. But there were brothers of Father Moog Cairns who died alongside Anthony Perry at uh, Eden Derry. 
And you also you also notice the first cousins, Stephen and Roger Cairns of Ballycrystal near Bunclody, who were killed in RG, County Louth. So it, it spread out all across various chapters of the 79th Rebellion. Uh, they were clearly killed uh, on the march to Mead uh, before the complete collapse of the Wexford uh, insurgency. And on the right here, we have a memorial to David uh, Hurley, who was um, ambushed by Yeomanry outside a Cork town in early 1798. So all across Ireland, you find these memorials. To locals, they'll see them every day, but to us that's interested in, in these low-ranking uh, insurgents or yeomanry, it's very interesting because the names are preserved, we just have to find them. So the archives, the archives can be frustrating at times, as one can imagine. It's it, You're not only scrolling through copper plate writing and film after film of microfiche where you might not find a name. It's, it can be quite frustrating, but then when, it could be a day you could find 10 names, 20 names. It's absolutely fantastic. It really shows the projects. It's, it's worthwhile to do. Um, rebellion papers, for instance, is the, main, is the main source I've been hitting lately in the National Archives in Dublin uh, well, until this uh, virus hit us, unfortunately. But um, the trial notes you could, are very detailed. You have examples of murders, executions, and you can also find army reports that were uh, written by officers to Dublin Castle. And uh, quite detailed, it also gives some detail about what was going on in a certain parish across the country and things like that. Like traditionally, in school, we're taught to believe that it was just Wexford, Carlo, Kildare, Wicklow, Antrim, Down, and Mayo, and Leitrim that were predominantly 1798 counties. Everywhere else was asleep. That's complete bull because all across Ireland, I have casualties, executions, murders on all sides. Like it's 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 phenomenal like what, what happened in this in this island two hundred and twenty two years ago. Also the uh, the rare first hand accounts can also reveal casualties and they're the hidden gems like for instance in the National Library or in Thorny you'll find the state and private papers, you can find loyalist accounts which are fantastic as well. Um so we find lots of things in the archives. I'm still not finished. So folklore Folklore is, is fantastic because as Sylvia Victor goes to history, he write, the victor always writes the history and unfortunately the history can be always one-sided. And in 1798's case, that's, that's been proven with Musgrave's history. Um, folklore passed down by the poor people. Unfortunately, we don't have much. We, have, we do have quite a lot of 1798-related folklore, but we don't have many casualties. And also folklore, you have to remember, is not fact. It cannot be classed as fact. It's, you have to take a pinch of salt with it. It's, you have to remember these, a lot of the folklore that was recorded in the 1930s, like that's 130 years after the rebellion. Names and events, stories could have manifested into something else after such a period of time. Names uh, could be completely changed within 130 years. In some cases, I found folklore to be to be completely true when it compares to newspapers from 1798. You find out names and events what happened um, to be true. So I respect folklore, but I still and I record the names I do find. But I would highlight this folklore cannot be taken as full fact. But folklore. In Ireland, as we know, it's we're fantastic for storytelling, for songwriting, for ballads passed down through generations. And out of those, we have names of, of people who died across Ireland. And that's been fantastic. Historical journals from 100 years ago are also, are also great. There were some great enthusiastic people around the time of the centenary in, in 1898 who went around and spoke to sons and grandchildren of veterans of the rebellion. Um, I love the public interaction on the Facebook page where people have come to me and with uh, family history and knowledge of an ancestor that was fought or died in the 79th rebellion. Local history groups across Ireland, they've been also great. They've, they've 
emailed me much information about the United Irishmen or about the Yeomanry and all sorts across across Ireland. It's absolutely fantastic response I've got there. Poetry and songs, as I mentioned, you have songs such as Kelly the Boy from Clan, which was written by PJ McCall in the 1860s. It doesn't reveal many names to me. It doesn't reveal any names to me by John Kelly, but it's uh, you can, it's just an example that at that period you had Bull of Vogue, who fears to speak of 98, and The Rising of the Moon. All these songs were, were all being released and uh, being published. But who fears to speak of 98? Clearly the Irish people did throughout the 19th century, all the way up into the late 19th century, because I'm going to prove to you now shortly, we have very few um, casualty names from the insurgent side, from battle especially. We have many from recorded murders and trials from across Ireland, many, but very few from battle and massacres. Headstones was also a great advantage to me. Here on the left, we have General Blake's grave near Ballin the Moak, uh, General George Blake. Um, <clears throat> he was from Garrickloon in, in County Galway, and he was executed, I believe, the day or the day after, uh, the day after or two days after the Battle of Ballin the Moak. At the top right, you have an example of a headstone where the family has inscribed a Richard Turner killed in the Irish Army at the Battle of Hobbitstown in North Kildare in 1798. Fantastic history this is. Sam McAllister's grave in Kilranilla near Kiltegan County Wicklow. It's quite an ornate grave, but it still shows the respect that was given to McAllister. Here on the right, we have the headstone of Dennis Carroll, who was executed on the 13th of June, 1798, age 14. He's recorded in the <clears throat> eyewitness of William Farrell, who focused on the Battle of Carlow and the executions that happened across County Carlow in late May and early June 1798. Uh, here's some images courtesy of a friend, Owen Dunbar from Gory, who sent me these fantastic images of two headstones in Knock Brandon near Gory County, Wexford. And you can see that they both died on the same day, so possibly these men died together. And look at their young ages. Uh, Matthew Henrik, he's 22 years of age, and then you have John Dial, who's 25 years of age. Very, very interesting when you, when you, when you come across the headstones, and there's quite a lot of headstones that are 798 related across Ireland. Again, like folklore, <clears throat> in some cases we cannot, we cannot state that they, died, that they were killed in the rebellion. When you see a headstone like this, where the dates do correlate to that period, and where there's about a young age, or unless it's dated by the family or local folk or local history, we can only claim that they possibly died in the rebellion, unfortunately. Um, here's more examples of headstones. <clears throat> on the right, we have, oh, sorry, on the left, we have John Codd, who was killed on June 20, 1798, age 70. Uh, in the middle here, these pictures are courtesy of <clears throat> North Wexford Historical Society. We're taken in Ross Minog near Bory County, Wexford, and we have the um, the body, the, the headstones of Miles Dial, who died on June 28, 1798, age 24. And here we have Simon Dial, who died July 4, 1798, the same date as the Battle of Ballygolan, which was fought close by. So these are fantastic. Headstones are fantastic sources for information. <clears throat> More examples on the top left, we have John Lowry of the parish of Kalinch in County Down. Uh, his headstone is in St. Fields in County Down, but quite interesting, if you look at the date, June 19, 1798, the date is wrong. St. Fields was actually fought on June 9th. In some cases, families, it, quite, it could have been a, a simple mistake, but sometimes families actually purposely change the dates on headstones um, to prevent retaliation within the community after the rebellion. If you look at the bottom right, you'll notice that here, here lies the body of John Dahl, who lived, beloved, closed his life for Christ and fortitude and died, scratched out the 18th of June, 1798, aged 38. What scratched out was a martyr. The local Lilas community were very upset when whoever erected the headstone had inscribed a martyr. So they had, as you can see, it was chiseled off. <clears throat> On the centre here, we have an image I found online, but 
It's uh, the, the headstone of Pat Kyo, who was executed in Lachlan Bridge on the 9th of June, 1798. Now, interestingly, to people who love 1916 history, I'm going to come to that now in a second. Pat Kyo was a great uncle of Miles Kyo, who accompanied General Custer to the, the Battle of Little Bighorn. Um, he was also a great, great uncle of Margaret Kyo, the nurse who died of uh, gunshot, who died from gunshot uh, wounds at South Dublin Union during the 1916 Rising in Dublin. She was uh, just an ordinary nurse who, who, who stayed to look after the wounded. Um, so there's a bit of connection there from 1798 to an American battle, the Battle of Little Bighorn, to um, the 1916 rebellion here in Ireland, in Dublin. On the top right, we have the famous John Kelly, the boy from Calan, who um, his headstone is in his hometown of Calan. It's quite an ornate, lovely headstone. You can, you can tell it was fairly, uh, it was invested upon during the time of the centenary. And at the bottom right, just a, a small memorial, but a lovely memorial for two, two pike men remembered by the local area, Lawrence Boggan and Richard Sinnott. And Lawrence Boggan, on his headstone within that graveyard, claims he died on the 5th of June. The local history claims, as proven here, that he was a pikeman, therefore he died possibly at the Battle of New Ross, which was fought on that day, or died from wounds from a, from a previous skirmish. Richard Sinnott died on June 8th, so we don't know exactly how Richard Sinnott died, but we know from local history in that area, in South Wexford, that they were pikemen. So they've been recorded as victims of the 1798 rebellion. So Crown and French casualties. So it actually be it actually be, it's amazing that these are actually very hard to find. Published regimental histories have let me down regarding Crown casualties because I've searched many British regimental histories and I've found very little even about 1798, let alone their casualties. The Ray Fencibles from North Scotland, they had a fantastic history where they gave great detail about their time in Ireland in 1798. And as you can see here, they give the names of those who died and also where they died, which is fantastic. It's great for anyone who's doing a small history of, such as here, the Battle of Tara, who gives all the names of, of those who died. Um, <clears throat> French military history, up until now, I haven't really looked much into, I haven't looked into anything regarding the French records, or if they do exist. I'd love to know if they do exist, but I will look into that for the future. And um, I hope to make it to um, the National Archives in London after this pandemic ceases, and also to the Chateau de Vincennes in Paris. Um, military historians, they've been beneficial but they haven't been they haven't been overly great in in, in helping me with with uh, this project in finding stuff relation to casualties. Now here's an example of my database. I'm not gonna put up too much because I don't want to bore you, but here is the example of what I have. These are only simple notes. So we have for instance, as I mentioned headstones, I have a John Fogarty in in Tipperary. He died on August 6, 1798. The cause of death is unknown. No age is recorded. So I just, I, I have that stated. We have Edward Foley, a private, a soldier of the Thai Yeomanry Corps. And I've got a lot of these names from a subscription list that was done for widows and orphans in 1799. It was where people paid into a subscription fund to look after uh, the loved ones of casualties of, of the Yeomanry or the British Forces, fantastic source of finding names. I found about 500 names off it, maybe more. Unfortunately, not all names. Um, some folklore. I have Matthew Foley of Ballynahoun, Kilmuckridge, County Wexford. He's mentioned in the Kilmuckridge Schools collection as having served at the Battle of Owlet Hill before being killed at the Battle of Arklow on June 9th. So little things like that. That's an example of what I've been what I've been doing over the last three years. Uh, another example here, and uh, it's intensely enjoyable over the last three years, I will admit.
here I have a Father Andrew O'Toole of Wicklow Town. Um, O'Toole came into much dispute with loyalists. Um, he wasn't well liked by the loyalist community across Wicklow. And he was also accused of um, giving clerical duties to the insurgents in some of their camps across Wicklow. And um, on the 23rd of August, 1788, O'Toole, whilst on religious duties, was strangled outside Wicklow Town by local loyalists. It gets very gruesome, and it's on both sides, and it really, doing this project, you really get to see the dark, dark side of 1798. An interesting period, but very, very dark. Here I have the story of Tom the Fairy Duffy. He was from Dublin City. Mary Ledbeater's account of the 90 year rebellion in Ballytore in South County Kildare gives a brief insight into Tom Duffy, where he came from Dublin on the morning of, of May 29th uh, to come for his sister and the loss of her yeoman husband at the recent Battle of Kilcullen. As you can read here, the widow, though uh, agonised with sorrow, found some little comfort in, in assuring uh, herself and her children of protection by reason of her husband having suffered on the side of the government. Her grief was mingled with astonishment, heightened to frenzy when she found she deceived herself. Her brother, a poor fairy Tom, was murdered. Her sons were murdered. Her servant boy was murdered. Her house was plundered. Her little daughter, on seeing her brother's dead body, fell into fits, which caused her death. And her own reason gave way. Very, very sad times to the 90 year rebellion. So I'm going to focus on a battle. I'm going to focus on casualties and recording casualties from battle. And here is an image by, by Father um, Foran, who was painted in the 1800s of the Battle of Owlet Hill, quite a famous picture in, seven, in 1798 history. Um, for those who don't know much about the Battle of Owlet Hill, it was the first field, major field engagement of Wexford in Wexford in 1798. It was fought on with Sunday, May 27th. And the people of central County Wexford, in fear of their lives, they amassed upon the hilltop of Owlers Hill. North Cork militia, under Colonel Foot, they, they marched up from Wexford Town to disperse this mob. As they were um, approaching the bulk of the mob at, uh, atop the, the hillside, to their left, unknown to them, a fusillade of muskets, stones, Everything was tossed at them. They were on to a, to a major surprise, and the rebels charged over the ditch and attacked to their left flank, causing pandemonium. Out of 110 troops, only five survived, including Colonel Foot. Um, it's been noticed the rebels spared very, very. They actually gave no. They spared no um, mercy to prisoners. It was, it was noted that one of the Cork men turned around, blessing himself, praying for mercy in Gaelic, and he was piped to death. It showed that the militia, a lot of these militia were Roman Catholics, but only three weeks beforehand, they'd marched into Wexford and they were, they were wearing the orange ribbon of the new orange order that was spreading across much of the, much of the east, north and, and the eastern coast. It was a very, very gruesome, very divided time socially in Ireland, politically and religiously, in very sad times. So here, uh, local history has preserved the names of six casualties on the insurgent side. And you have Thomas Donovan of Gould of Oak, who was great friends with Father John Murphy. You have Quincy of Courtclock, a weaver, and I believe a distant relation to Michael Fortune of folklore.ie. You have Humphrey Crowley of Kill Pierce, Dan Summers of Finchogue, John Dempsey of Munavullen and Murphy of Kilcotty. And I found in the Kilmuckridge School's folklore collection, I found a William Bulger of Rahian Ski is also recorded as having been killed at the Battle of Owlers Hill. So here is the North Cork militia casualties that I, I took from the, the Widows and Orphans subscription list. Quite a lot of names. Now, unfortunately, it didn't give the location of their deaths, so they passed. The majority of them died at Owlert Hill, yes, of course, but some also died at the Battle of Enniscorty, which was fought the following day. So here you can see their names, well recorded. We'll, we'll see now quite shortly what rebel names being recorded for future battles. On the top right, you can see in a beautiful mound on the summit of Owlert Hill called Tullock of Tullish, the Mound of Light. 
It's a recreation of Newgrange and it's a beautiful location. When the sun sets and you stand within it, you can see the sun setting directly over the distant Vinegar Hill. Very symbolic hill. And um, the victims of Skull of Oak were all recorded by various loyalists uh, eyewitness accounts, predominantly Richard Musgrave. Fantastic work. He, he went around in the years immediately after the rebellion to, to parishes across Wexford and recorded the names of those who were, who were butchered in the massacre of Skull of Oak. Now, to anyone who doesn't know much about Skull of Oak, it was a, a horrific sectarian attack that was carried out after the Battle of New Ross, where certain members of the insurgent army came and burned the barn that contained over 100, 120 loyalist prisoners. This atrocity was slammed immediately by the United Irishmen across Wexford, including Miles Byrne. He mentions it in his, in his memoirs. It was slammed by Bagnall Harvey, the United Irish leader of, of County Wexford. It put a, a sour feeling on, on the Wexford insurgency. It, it, it was very dishonouring to them. Unfortunately, Wexford was, the, the insurgent army in Wexford was, a, was, a, was an amalgamation of the United Irish, people terrified for their lives after, after months of terror, terrorising by local yeomanry, and the defenders. And the defenders, as we know, would carry out sectarian and agrarian attacks um, on their neighbours. We have the victims of the Wexford Bridge massacre from June 20th, where Protestant loyalist prisoners were taken out, piped by these defenders and tossed into the river below. Very gruesome, as you can tell. But the names have thankfully been recorded uh, for these victims. Now, in comparison, here's early massacre casualties for the insurgency. Carlo Town, where it's believed that between 500 and 650 were killed, we have only two names. The Battle of Tara and the massacre that happened immediately afterwards, where 300 to 500 were killed, four names. Gibbeth Rath on the Cara of Kildare, where 300 to 400 were killed. That's the only names I could find. And I've searched many sources, and this is the first time I've brought these names together in one list. Unfortunately, I believe this is as much as we can get. Why, this is the word, I asked this question, why, why do people, why do people fear to speak of 1798? Why, I'm sure there was other family members of casualties who survived. Why, why weren't names preserved? And that's a question I keep asking myself. And it's very frustrating when you're trying to find more and more names and you just keep asking yourself, why did it not record more names? The local history was not preserved, was not written down, whatever. You just can't find them, unfortunately. And a lot of them were lost. Neuros, June 5th, 1798, a very, very dark day in the rebellion, possibly the most bloodiest day in the rebellion. This happened immediately before the massacre school of Oaks. So you have a town battle which happened on very narrow streets where thousands upon thousands of insurgents attacked a very heavily defended town where a cannon blasted up these narrow streets and wiped out uh, thousands of insurgents. It's believed that between 1,500 and 3,000 insurgents were killed on the streets in Euros that day. Here are the names I found so far. Possibly 3,000 casualties and uh, this is all I can find so far. Quite sad. Arklow, where up to a thousand casualties are estimated to have died, or a thousand insurgents. Here we have less than a dozen. Most of them are from Miles Bourne. Sainfield and County Down fought on the same day as the Battle of Arklow. I so I found the names of the York infantrymen that were killed at the Battle of St. Fields from the subscription list of the widows and orphans. But to look at the insurgency. And it was noted that it was a tough battle and that the insurgents lost quite a few there also. Three names, unfortunately. And two of them are from headstones that, are, that exist in St. Fields today. And then the loyalists, where we found the massacre of the McKee family. 
Ballin Hinch from County Down. A very, very bloody battle. The only names I can find. Here we have, in the background uh, illustration, we actually have Hugh McCulloch of Bangor on your left, being led in by soldiers before he's to be hanged. In the centre, we have Captain Henry Evans of the Monaghan Militia, lying mortally wounded. And at the back, you can see the cavalry chasing down the insurgents, whose names we don't have today. Vinegar Hill, June 21st, the longest day, the, one of the most bloodiest battles in for the for the North Wexford um, hike men. There's the names that we have today. Most are from Miles Barnes, some are from Headstones. And it's believed that up to a thousand people were killed upon Vinegar Hill and during the retreat phase of the battle. Ballon the Muck, most of these uh, were from folklore, or a lot of them were recorded by Richard Hayes during his uh, fabulous history, The Last Invasion of Ireland, during the 1930s, where he approached elderly people across Leitrim, Longford, and Sligo, and Mayo, and recorded these names for the Battle of Ballinamook. So the future, and what the future lies for the 70 year rebellion casualty database. As you can see, I've, I've done quite a lot, but I hope to keep, uh, I hope to continue doing more and I hope to find more and more names as I go along. Unfortunately, this pandemic has limited my research quite a bit, but I do hope to to get to the National Archives in London and to the Chateau de Vincennes uh, in Paris, and uh, also engage more and more with the public or Hopefully, there's people out there who have information for me about family history of the 79 Rebellion, a distant relation of kills, and doesn't know about this project. And I'd love to hear from them. I'd love to hear from um, anyone at all that has any interest and enthusiasm towards the 79 Rebellion. And I love engaging with, with anyone with some interest in me in regards to that. So, if you uh, would like to follow, if you're new to this and, uh, and you wish to follow the project, you can. Continue and see the progress of this project on Facebook at the page 79th Year Rebellion Casualty Database. And also, please follow Trust in the They've been giving us absolute fantastic work over the last two weeks from brilliant historians across Ireland. And um, I'd highly recommend you stay on Zoom and you follow these lectures over the coming weeks. It's fantastic history. And also, search their YouTube channel as well for any of the uploaded lectures that are from the last few weeks. So, um, yeah, I'll hand it back to you, Marcus. Okay, yeah. Oh, can you hear me now? Do you want to? Uh... Oh, I mean, can you hear me now? I can. Yes, I'm back. Sorry, I couldn't get unmuted there. Sorry about that. Now, we've, you have lots of questions for you, okay? Oh, yes. um, so there's been plenty of interest. On, that was a fascinating talk that you had. Um, Thank so you. So let's go through this. Uh, Liam has asked, I'd be interested in understanding how many of the 1798 rebellion ended up emigrating and serving in armies overseas. That's true. Uh, a lot more from the north is known is known to have emigrated to America. America weren't quite friendly with, with all these rebellious Irish coming over to them. Um, we have also a lot of the Irish exiles who went to France and served with Napoleon in the Irish um, in the Irish Legion there. We also have a lot of the transported Irish, and this really hasn't been touched off um, in Ireland. And the, the thousands of Irish people were transported after the 1790 rebellion. 
uh, to Australia and to the British services across the world. A lot of them were sent to the West Indies and to um, um, uh, like and Australia. We also have um, this group that I'm quite fascinated by. About 1,400 Irish were transported as a gift to the King of Prussia. And quite interestingly, some of these Irish soldiers who, um, who were serving in the Prussian army, when the Prussians surrendered to the French several years later in the Napoleonic Wars, old friends were reunited and they actually swapped tunics and ended up, um, when they became prisoners, swapped tunics and became soldiers in the Irish Legion uh, fighting for Napoleon. We also have uh, John, or sorry, William Aylmer of um, Kildare. We have one of the Devros of Wexford, John Devro, I believe. And they had, they were involved in some of the independence struggles in Latin America. In 18, 18, 18, 19. William Aylmer actually died in Jamaica from wounds he received in battle in South America. So it's very interesting. A lot of the, a lot of, a lot of the insurgents who did make it out after the Seventeen Eighty Rebellion actually did well for themselves. So, okay, uh, we have another question from Colm O'Cribbin. Uh, there is a memorial. Oh, sorry, no. Let's do GOS, GOS first. Anything on the Battle of the Big Cross led by Tig on Asna near Clonakilty? Um, very little. Um, I received some information, and there is some on Dukas and folklore uh, regarding the Battle of the Big Cross. Uh, we believe about 100 people died in that battle on June 19th. Uh, Tygo Donovan being one, but there's several, there is several, there's not many. I think there's only about two or three casualties from that battle. We also have uh, Sergeant O'Reilly of the Westmead uh, Militia who was um, killed in that battle also. He's actually the only, he was the only Crown casualty of that day. There was only one um, one casualty of the, of the Crown Forces. But unfortunately, only a couple of casualties from the back of the cross. Sure. Um, Colm O'Cribbin, there is a memorial to Pod O'Donoghue near Ashburn, who is a blacksmith who celebrated in both English and Irish poems. And just one thing for Colm, if he hasn't seen it, um, in 1798, Year of Blood, the documentary we made with Colm, um, Tola Collier is interviewed at that memorial. Mm. Um, do you know anything about Pod O'Donoghue, Colm, that you'd like to share? Not much, not much. I, I, the poetry says it all, really, about Pod O'Donoghue, and I believe that's all we have to to describe them, you know, it's uh, individuals, Barrett, unless they're Wolf Tone or Henry Jai McCracken or, <laughs> yeah. or Sam no, Nielsen, right. yeah. they'll have the books written about them, whereas unfortunately the likes of Pod, I don't know who they'll, they'll get their poems, okay. you know, it's, it's the way it is, unfortunately. Now we're nearly halfway through, you have so many questions here, which is great. Oh, How did oh, you yeah. find the Catholic Church looking at the 1798 rebellion, were they all on the side of Father John Murphy? Oh no. No, no, Archbishop, I believe it was Archbishop Troy who referred to the Catholic priests who sided with the rebellion as the feces of the church. Um, the Catholic church wanted nothing to do with militant mil, uh, republicanism or whatever it was, whatever they, they referred to it at that time. They didn't, that mess, that big turnout. They didn't want any association with it whatsoever. Um, of course, Daniel O'Connell as well. Paddy Cullivan is going to highlight that quite soon about Paddy, about Daniel O'Connell's hatred towards the United Irishman. Uh, Paddy will, will uh, discuss that in his book, upcoming book, which I will recommend. Also, uh, it's by the time of the 1860s, it's only around that period that the likes of Father John Murphy, Father Michael Murphy and Mo Cairns become somewhat nationalistic heroes. Uh, it's when the publication of Father Cavanagh's book, The Insurrection of County Wexford, he gets rid of that dirty secret society attachment and he makes it that he actually legitimizes Richard Musgrave's uh, loyalist account of 1801 by saying it was a, a rebellion led by Catholic priests fighting against Protestants. Mm. That's not the case. That was not the truth. Catholics and Protestants fought on one side, Catholics and Protestants fought on the other side. That's the way it was. It was a dirty, messed up civil war. And unfortunately, 1798 history has been manipulated by various historians over the last 200 years. And some people see one side of it and that's the way they accept it. And some people accept this side. And it's, 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 it's 
messed up rebellion. Um, but yeah, the Father John Murphy. Like today we have a statue of Father John Murphy in Tullow. We have one in Enniscorty standing there proud with his with his two fingers up wearing his his his, um, his vestments and stuff like that. It was a bit of a the connection of nationalism with the Catholic Church thing, you know, as we know from the symbolism of 1916 also, you know, so that's the way it was. Uh, Daniel Jack, uh, I am looking out my window at Cave Hill up at Belfast and it always amazes me how close we are to the United Irishmen. I can literally walk in their footsteps. Equally, I'm fascinated by the lineage as many Republicans from the 1916 to 23 period had direct relations who were United Irishmen, for example, Seamus Robinson's great-grandfather. Uh, um, there is a link though, isn't there? Like an awful lot of the people from 1916 to 23 did idolize some of those in 1798. Um, mm. I found out with Pierce and Connolly and um, Ned Broy and even Collins to a degree. Um, Colm O'Cribbeen, um, the Scottish Fencibles of Ray are mentioned in that poem about Paul O'Donoghue, the Battle of Tara was early on and the pikemen were rooted, but the Wexford pikemen fought their way through Carlow, up to Mead and even across to Dublin. There's evidence along the route. And as Colm, I think, showed in the, in the presentation, even up to RD in County Loud near me. Um, so um, was there many people there by the time they got up? Like how many were left? <clears throat> Not, uh, the estimations are hard to gather, but we have to remember early June 1798, the Wexford Army, Insurgency Army, is estimated to have been about 30,000. Okay. Um, of course, naturally, there's, their, their families were with them. Not all of them were active militants, insurgents, you know. Um, but that was the, the general core. By the time of the battles and things looking bad and the British court on Wexford in, on, in June 1798, a lot of them fled, a lot of them at home. <clears throat> they, they broke their... They had to keep their heads down. Some yeah. of them hid in the hills, the bogs, and the forestries. Now, by the time they... Not, not all, as we know from Miles Bourne's memoirs, not all went up to me as well. Miles Bourne actually disagreed with with their tactic. It was quite stupid. Like he wanted to remain in the hills because it suited pikemen warfare. He didn't want to go up into the flat plains of Kildare, Leash, and parts of Meath to stand in the fields and be surrounded by cavalry and then be blasted to bits by artillery and musket. Nearly, like, to... nearly like flying columns versus 1916. Exactly. And then that period, um, that period, you have um, guerrilla warfare started intensely in, in, in County Wick, in, sorry, in County Wicklow. A lot of them probably be, after weeks and weeks of being battered and blown off the fields by cannon, they realise the only way we can be effective uh, is by guerrilla warfare. And that's been proven by Joseph Holt and Michael Dwyer and uh, even while I was born at the, the Bridge of Green Anne in July 1798. So they, they wanted to consolidate themselves and focus on ambushing. Okay. Uh, Liam O'Sullivan. Yeah, sorry, go on. We reckon only about a thousand or so went into County Meath, but as they were going up, they lost a lot of people at Clamard and at uh, uh, Slane, RD, and then into North County Dublin at Ballybockle and Knightstown Bog. They were decimated at that stage. A lot of them had fled and gone back to Wicklow or Dublin. Sure. So how you uh, Liam has also asked, I knew you'd ask this, I'd be interested in understanding if Colin came across any 1798 involvement in Kilkenny. I'd like to add he's doing an amazing job. So oh, I'll say nothing about that. Okay. <laughs> didn't, the cat, didn't, didn't the cats only piss on the powder in 98? <laughs> oh, here we go. Civil War started oh. already. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You know, in fairness, now there was a... Um, I won't go into the New Ross Association up there in, in Glenmore Hill. Okay. Uh, there seemed to be like a little party up there now when the extra men were fighting in New Ross. But okay. I know, in respect... In respect, there was some mobilisation, but there was poor leadership in, in Kilkenny. Yeah. They didn't have the strong, um, they didn't have the calibre of leadership like that was seen in, in Wexford and some parts of Victor. Carlo had poor leadership. Um, that's why they failed miserably and never re attempted to reignite. So, unfortunately, Kilkenny. Uh, it is what it is. They don't do this. They don't do this. 
Okay. Uh, Marianne Kavanagh. Uh, aha, my ancestor Thomas Donovan gets a mention. Very good, Marianne. Um, Liam is also asked, uh, we have obvious 1916 and other commemorations. How would Colin think we should commemorate 1798? Well, if anyone remembers 1998, it was fantastic. It was parades everywhere and stuff like that. But then again, <clears throat> to now commemorate 1798, they have attempted it, is to reheal the wounds that were caused in 1798. And, and thankfully, that is happening across Ireland now. And the ending of sectarianism, we'd love to see that gone out of this, out of this island. And um, we'd like to, it's a shared history. It's, it doesn't belong to nationalism. It doesn't belong to Republicans. It doesn't belong to loyalists. It's a history that belongs to Irish people across all of Ireland. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's a history that, that everyone should look into. It. It's, a, it's a fantastic history. And of course, it is, it is a very tormenting history like, to look at and see what was done to various sides. And we, we can't let that overwhelm us, our thoughts. But um, to commemorate it, we, we, we can best commemorate it by remembering it, yeah. really. Uh, what stands out for you in 1798? All the battles. God, there's so many of them. Um, <clears throat> One that stands out, though. The fact that what stands out for me is it, it, it affected everything in Irish society. It's estimated 30,000 died. Thousands transported to Australia and to the British services across the world. Uh, many more uh, went into exile into America. Uh, it affected communities all across Ireland, but not only in battle, not only in murder across Ireland, but we had, na we had a naval battle. One of, the la um, one of the last naval battles of the 18th century was fought off the coast of Donegal when the French met the, uh, the Royal Navy under um, Commandant um, Warren and fought a tremendous sea battle just off the west coast of Donegal. Uh, things like that, we have uh, an uprising in Australia, in Sydney. We have an uprising, an attempted uprising in Newfoundland. So 1798 had ripples all across the world, and it's not known about. 1798 is not discussed. General history books don't touch off 1798. It's only really known in Ireland. Okay. Without the 1798 rebellion, we wouldn't have the term United Kingdom today. Hmm. You know, it's, 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 it's a fantastic period of history. Even I thought in the run-up to it, like, I mean, the founding of, like, the Orange Order and, and uh, some of the other groups, I thought it was fascinating, knowing the origins of where some of these groups came from. Um, what, Jackie Finden, why is 98 not remembered as much as 1916, considering the 98 people would have been the heroes of 1916? Period. It's 222 years now. You know, not many people talk about 1641 or Hugh O'Neill now. It's... it's Time is going on and people forget we, our associations with, uh, with was 100 years ago, many Irish families were still deeply rooted in communities that they would have been in 1798. Nowadays, people are mo moving around the place. They don't have any historical connection to where they're living now, stuff like that. And people are forgetting a lot of the local history as well. Like, I was fortunate enough to grow up in an area where a local school teacher recorded 1798 folklore from the older people. And I heard a lot of that growing up. He's now since passed away. And there's nobody around here that would know that now. Yeah. So, oh, because I listened, it's now been preserved. But that, that, that's a small piece of local history that could have been wiped out. And it's happening all across Ireland, unfortunately. And it's because it's, it's a long period of time, 222 years now. People just don't really care. They've no connection. They've been sanitized away from 1798. They don't have a, a personal connection to it anymore compared to the men of 1916, men and women of 1916. They don't have that, that proud link to, to that period. It, it's weird. Um, it actually links to the next question by Liam. He'd be interested in how Colin thinks that the 1798 monuments erected in 1998 uh, are being maintained. Um, they're not being maintained very well, though, are they? I mean, no. you know, Croppy's Acre, for example, um, it's full of heroin needles and... Yeah, well, even, like, it was a fantastic year all in that period. It was literally a stone put up in every townland across Wexford, Wicklow, and it's fantastic to see, but, but you, you, you drive past some memorials today and you can't even read them because they're just absolutely covered in moss and dirty dust. It's... it's Look, it's not down to the community to look after them if they wanted to, but 
it's it is sad like well, why invest in such a monument and you're just going to be neglected yeah exactly yeah so, um dominic price who was in the film with you um in Gahan's book on the 1798 Rising in Wexford, he says the Bull of Vogue massacre was carried out when news of the deliberate setting alight of the rebel hospital in New Ross reached them guarding the prisoners. The screams of the wounded in the hospital could be heard throughout the town. Great point, Dominic. Uh, Francis Higgins, I spoke at length with Guy Bernier on why so little names were recorded. He covers it in his book, Disremembering 1798. Um, Colm O'Cribbean, could we suggest a memorial each year in the June bank holiday weekend? Wexford has regular commemorations, but we should have a national one. What do you think? That's a good idea, yeah. And I think I believe there was to be there was to be some sort of plan like that. I mean, the, the, the bicentennial parades they actually occurred from 1990, early 1998, right up to 2003, 2004. I believe the last one I was at was in the Glenview Mall for the unveiling of the Michael Dwyer statue up there. All that period, every few weeks you'd have a parade here and there, and it was fantastic. It was getting the community out, and it was people were learning their, a bit of the local history. And like Michael Dwyer, for instance, now he's still known all across County Vico. Mm. Like it's, it's it's phenomenal that people of even my generation they know about Michael Dwyer. They don't know about their own local. I've, I've, I've named names to several of my friends, and you don't care, you quite honest with you. But Michael Dwyer, Sam McAllister. And uh, Father John Murphy, these are the, the names they know of. They know they don't they don't know of the of the, the low ranking insurgents or yeomanry that were killed. Or it is the same with Irish people in 1916 too. I mean, they know the leaders, but they don't know the people who actually fought, who actually shot the guns. You know, it's it's very similar. Um, the Sea Hickey, the Battle of Carrigmoclear, South Tipperary, another heroic Irish failure due to informants. Fine memorial exists there today, but bring your hiking boots as there is a fair incline to the site. Thanks for the tip. Uh, Jerem, yeah, sorry. Were you going to say something there? Or? Yeah, no, it's quite interesting. Uh, you can actually see Shlieve Naman. I'm here in South Wicklow. And yeah. from my local here, I can see Shlieve Naman straight across. It's Carlow and Kilkenny being flat counties. You can see straight across the Shlieve Naman. I can actually see where uh, the side of the mountain, where Carrick and Clare happened. Jesus. Uh, and Jeremy Mullally, uh, Colm, great research, very challenging. Thanks for a great talk. Marianne Kavanagh, thank you for all your hard work. Uh, Dominic Price, fabulous talk, Colm. Trojan work, congratulations. Brendan Boyd, great work. Any records of a massacre in Kalala post BNM? Uh, well, any records of massacre in Kalala? I have a few names, quite a few names now, yeah. There's a um, kind of name off... off uh, I'd love to build a story all these names in my head, but <laughs> uh, one book I would recommend is Richard Hayes' The Last Invasion of Ireland. He did fabulous work back in the 1930s, and he gave a fantastic account of names of casualties. People died in the Massacre of Kalala in late September okay. 1798, and he, like, he doesn't just touch off the Matthew Buells and, uh, and the Valentine Jordans and those names. He touches off the... I believe one of us a uh, Flanagan, I can't name him offhand. Yeah. But um, he, um, fantastic work. If you can get in the local library, you can buy it online, please do. It's it's The Last Invasion of Ireland by uh, Richard Hayes. Okay. Uh, Shane Waters, brilliant talk, Colm. Christina McMullen from America, thoroughly enjoyed, thank you. TJ Mills, really interesting, great talk, thanks a million, Colm. John Malloy, yeah. brilliant lecture. Roger Oliver Plunkett Waters, this is world-class research and wonder about excavations, the extent, and if there are grounds, pardon the pun, for more excavations. Are there grounds for more excavations, friend? Maybe some of the battlefield sites? Uh, there was excavations that were, it was a metal detection intrusive uh, project that was carried out on the slopes of Vinegar Hill in 2017 alongside geophysics. Uh, that was carried out by a team in Wexford, I don't know exactly who was over it. I know Damien Shields, the military historian for Ireland, one of the prominent military historians, he was involved. 1798 Century Nine Scored, he was involved. And they did find, um, they found musket balls, they found parts of a pistol, I believe. And I think they were able to determine what I tried to find in 2009. See, unfortunately, my, my project at that time, I couldn't dig because I didn't have an archaeological license at the time. Yeah. Well, it was only a metal, it was only a metal detection, and um, 
the geophysics, I believe, found a mass grave up there, which is mentioned uh, by Joanna Barrington several months after the rebellion that the ground was like a sponge because of the all the bodies been beneath the clay, you know. Well, when I went when but, I went up uh, there with um, I think it was Kathy Keane or maybe Owen, uh, yeah. is there a golf course kind of built around there or on some of the ground of the battlefield site? Yeah, well, it was. It's closed down now, unfortunately. But that was that was there in nineteen eighties. Yeah, yeah, very so, nice. yeah. Again, it goes to show in terms of like I mean, a battlefield site. You know um, how it's been treated in Ireland, I suppose. Um, sorry. Well, personally, it's it's personally it's it's the encroachment upon the hill by housing estates. That's my own personal opinion. Yeah. I'll, I'll gladly state it. It's I don't. There's very little respect given to some battlefields in this country. I, I will admit that. And yeah. when you up, standing up on Vinegar Hill, and I was only up there before the restrictions came in, and I saw a school just being built directly where General Lake's forces attacked the hill. Yeah, I know. I know. It's happened so much actually around the country, not just for 1798, but every period. Um, St Star Clan, very interesting column. Thank you. Johnny Doyle, very yep. good session. Thank you. My Doyles are from Salisbury. And still there, just outside Enniscorthy, zero from any family about 1798. Uh, H.P. Lima O'Rourke, hi, Column, excellent talk. You should consult the papers of the Church of Ireland, Bishop of Ferns, and Leilin uh, Eusebius Weaver, who wrote prolifically during the 98 Rebellion. The papers, originals, and transcripts are preserved in the National Library of Ireland, the representative church body library. Uh, Shane Waters. <laughs> <laughs> Shane Waters has said, excellent Kilkenny bashing. <laughs> uh, Colin would like to apologise to the people of Kilkenny for that. No, um, Larry Scallon, uh, excellent talk. Thanks. Uh, Kivin, there's an Irish language poem about the 1798 in Kilkenny. Uh, Precon Kilkenny. Uh Gosh, this q and is brill. Thank you. Uh, I now want to learn more. Thank you. Uh, from Mark, do we know why they didn't wait until they had more firearms? Seems lost before begun to go against the British military with mostly pikes. So, like, why didn't they wait until they had more firearms? It depends, really. Kildare had plans to go in, in late May. They had hoped that the French would come. They were, they were very, um, they were, uh, they had great faith in the French coming, but unfortunately, French logistics let them down in the end. Yeah. French didn't come until the end of August. Uh, it was the same in, in the north as well. The northern command, a lot of the leaders up there were very reluctant to going into battle until the French came. They knew the main reason wasn't it wasn't numerical strength. They had the people. It was weapons. And see what happened was, even though what happened was in late 1797 and early 1798, there was a lot of arms raids going on. And that was was pro and the cons that and the pros was they were getting some weapons, but the cons was it created martial law. It it caused the yeomanry to come down harder on the people and weapons were found. And then they had the um, now, who were the yeomanry for those who don't know? The yeomanry was like a local police force. It was predominantly a magistrate's a local landowner's uh, personal police force. Okay. Um led by orange men in some cases filled with Catholics in other cases, and unfortunately, two massacres uh, were involved with the Omri, and that was Dunlavin Green in County Wicklow mm. on May 25th, and Carnew, oh sorry, Dunlavin was May 24th, Carnew was May 25th, and the Omri, the Protestant Omri within those units actually lined up their comrades who were Roman Catholics and shot them dead rough uh, times, as they ended earlier. Okay. But uh, the, the weapons, I think it was like likes of Wexford, it, it, it ignited. Yeah. People couldn't take anymore. They just yeah. rallied to the hills. They had no battle plan. Yeah. They just took what they could take. They could take the sides, the, the bill hooks, the pikes, the stones. That's all they had. And then whatever weapons they could amass. Uh, Brian McGee, I remember the TV program Year of the French in 1982, but can never find us again. Did you see it? I've seen two episodes, but that's about it. You know. Episodes two. Uh, Dominic Price, um, in, now, now this is really interesting. In the new Junior Cert history course, the American 1776 and the French 1789 events are referred to as revolutions, while the 1798 uprising 
comes under a description of, inverted commas, physical force. If America and France can be described as revolutions, why not 1798? That's a very good point. Um, I class it as a revolution. It was, it was, it was, it was failed revolution, unfortunately. But uh, I respect the the ideals of the United Irishmen. They had very revolutionary ideas. They're they're sons of the Enlightenment. It was they were sons of that thinking that we saw in America. Um, it was actually a lot of Irish influence upon the patriots of America that the revolution spawned. It was. Uh, a lot of the Shearer's brothers, Father Mo Cairns, Edward Fitzgerald, they either witnessed or they were influenced by the French Revolution. Yeah. Um, Samuel Nielsen, the Belfast Jacobin, as he's nicknamed, he 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 was a, a Francophile. He he adored, but you know, adored, I should say, but he um, Belfast, for instance, commemorated Bastille Day two two years after the event. It was it was it was a revolutionary period, but unfortunately, because the leadership had been taken out by the time the rebellion started in 1798. Those with the liberal-minded thinking were replaced with low-ranking baronial captains, unfortunately some were defenders, people with different ideals. Some people took were given commands uh, against their wishes and it just imploded into a mess. 1798 just imploded into a, into a mess. It wasn't this... Uh, in some of my witness accounts, Miles Barnes, for instance, he, he talks of this United Irish vision. Mm. In other eyewitness accounts, there's no mention of that. Edward Hay doesn't want, I mean, in his account of the rebellion in Wexford, he doesn't want to know about it. Yeah. He doesn't talk with this this ideal of liberty, fraternity, and, and equality. So, yeah, it is, it, it's, been, it's been perceived since as this dirty war, like I mentioned earlier, between Catholics and Protestants, which is wrong. Yeah. There's Catholics and Protestants versus Catholics and Protestants. And it was a, unite, a uniting on some sides, which was what the United Irish men wanted. It was to unite the three major religions of Ireland, but they were united for the wrong reasons and they were divided for the wrong reasons as yeah. well. And, and the Presbyterians was, as well. Like, I mean, the Presbyterians include, were... Yeah, I, include, I didn't even include, know. Yeah. Like, I was learning a lot about the history of the Presbyterians from even doing the 1798 Rebellion. The whole thing is twi turned on its head. What do you think you know by it? It's really, really... Kind of refreshing, actually, to see where everything came from. Um, oh, yeah. Well, nice. Colin, I have some headstone photos from Antrim and Down, which I will PM to you. I haven't found my ancestor's grave yet okay. due to lockdown. Thank okay. you for tonight. Danny, well, I agree with Dominic. Neve has it. Absolutely incredible research. Thank you, Colin. Have to agree. Yeah. Amy, well done, Colin. Great work as always. Fiona O'Rourke, excellent talk, Colin. Patrick's iPhone, brilliant talk, lads, really enjoying it here. And thanks for the mention. That's Paddy Cullivan. And just want to say Paddy Cullivan's working on a book. And for me and for Colm, well, for me anyway, if it wasn't for Paddy Cullivan doing his 1798 10 Dark Secrets, um, I wouldn't have even started on the 1798 Rebellion. Um, the way he told it, I was, I was very annoyed that I didn't know about it. I knew everything to do with 1916 to 22, but 1798, I didn't. And it's, it's amazing as a battle. So Paddy Colvin, make sure to check him out too. Uh, Marianne Kavanagh, as I'm sure you're aware, Colin, my ancestor, Thomas Donovan, Donovan sorry, killed his own cousin, John Donovan, a yeoman in Bula Vogue. Kathleen Cleary, oh, we have a 1798 monument here in Thurles under threat of being removed. Mm, yeah, I was thinking that could happen. Yeah, well, I tell you... The more publicity you can bring to that, the more we can put public pressure maybe on maybe stopping that, you know. Um, can you send me a message on uh, or a comment on the 1798 page? I'd love to see more about that. If there's possibly any articles, local newspapers or anything, because yeah. maybe we can uh, build up something from this and prevent that. Because I did actually see a picture of that monument in Tardis. It is a fantastic monument. I wouldn't like to see anything like that happen. I wouldn't want to see what happened in the southern, uh, it, whether we agree with me or not, but I'm not, I'm not talking politics, but I don't agree with history being ripped down, like what happened in the southern states in America. Regardless of what happened in the past, I don't agree with forceful removal of, of history. Yeah. And unfortunately, some I'm afraid that maybe 50 years to 100 years down the line, some people might like to see a Catholic priest in, in the town of Tullow. So even though it's Father John Murphy, they might like to see a statue of him, pull yeah. it down. That's what I'm afraid about. Um, history should be there. Yeah, if anyone from Turles uh, is about 
Could you uh, message the 1798 Rebellion Casualty Database about the threat of the 1798 monument being removed? Uh, Marianne Cavanaugh, from what I understand from Furlong's book, Tom Donovan was a great influence on Father John Murphy. Do you know anything else about this? Uh, Tom Donovan, yeah, he was a good friend. Uh, it was actually, it was on Donovan's uh, farm that Father Murphy stayed and actually it's the whole place has been uh, renovated in the last 20 years since since 1998 and you can actually visit Father John Murphy's restored cabin uh, it's just outside um, Tom Tom Donovan's house just in Boulevard so yeah but unfortunately Tom Donovan didn't last long in the Welsh Rebellion he, he killed his cousin John uh, John Donovan who was the uh, member of the Camolan Cavalry at the Harrow and Lieutenant Bucky and the following day, he was killed at the Battle of Howard Hill, unfortunately. So he didn't, he didn't see much of the rebellion, but he's still, he was still a, a prominent name of the rebellion in, in his folklore of Wexford. You always often hear of Tom Donovan um, being mentioned because, because of his high status within the circle of friends with Father Muffin. Okay, Alana Dillon, uh, excellent talk as always. Amazing work, well done. And Peter Keenan, thanks, Colm. Excellent talk, great to hear. Look forward to hearing more. So, Colin, when are you going to write yeah. a book on this? Well, when am I going to finish it, Marcus? That's the thing. I need to wait for this pandemic to go away. I, I have seen Colin's uh, database, and I say it's like the yellow pages in terms of like size. It's incredible, the amount of, uh, that you have. Um, the other thing that I would say about 1798 is that once you get the bug, it's very hard to get rid of it. Um, mm. It's completely, it's all over the country. It's not just Waxford, it's everywhere. Um, Marianne Kavanagh, Wow, great. I'll visit as soon as I can. Thanks. I look forward to reading your book. Just remind people what the name of your Facebook page is again. The 1798 Rebellion Casualty Database. Yeah, and if we have given you a little bit of an itch, do check out his Facebook page. It's incredible. And if you do want to see a documentary about it, we've made two 1798 Year of Blood as well. Um, I'd like to thank you, Colin, for doing this because there's very few other people who are doing this. And uh, I hope when the lockdown ends, we'll get to travel around plenty more hills, hedges, <laughs> and fields looking for rare 1798 artifacts. So yes. thank you very much, everybody. Definitely. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow at 8. Thanks. Thank Colin. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Just <laughs> 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 <laughs>